We're going to be in Psalm 32, a uh, passage that Chad read this morning. And then uh, halfway through, we're going to flip to 1 Samuel 15. So Psalm 32, maybe a bookmark in 1 Samuel. Kristen, how are you? Congratulations. 1 Samuel 15 on the back side. Jared Vote, you might want to stop smiling so much when you play the guitar. I was having, he was sheltered by the ladies, but he was having a lot of fun up here. So appreciate you guys leading us in worship. About five years ago, um, I experienced our, my first and only, hopefully only, church split. It was a really difficult time for my family. It was an even harder time for the church. Uh, family members that had been there their entire life went through something like that. It's just, um, it's just really difficult. But before everything came to a head at this church, they hired a church consultant to come in and try to mediate the situation. And this particular guy spent many hours. Um, he did a lot of research. He got documentation, a lot of phone calls. He lived in Florida. He was completely off-site. And his plan was to come back to the church for about a week, 10 days, and begin just a really intense week of, of reconciliation, of working through it. And everything was, was originally kind of going according to plan. Uh, he came out first few days, uh, lots of meetings, lots of hard meetings with the uh, elders, deacons, and, and everybody else who was involved. Um, and, then a, and then a call came in from one of the pastors. And the uh, pastor said, hey, I'd like, to, I'd like to meet with all the elders and deacons in this particular church consultant. And they sat down in a, a little room together as a, a meeting room. And he immediately resigned his position as a pastor during that meeting. Uh, didn't even give this church consultant had put together a, a workable, kind of realistic, very hopeful plan of reconciliation, but, but wasn't even interested in discussing any of that plan. He immediately resigned and took half the staff with him two miles up the road and planted another church. Later on, we found out that he had secured a website for that new church and a location for them to meet two months before the consultant ever came on site. Um, gave his last sermon on unity, John 17, and walked out and up the street. A close friend of mine drove, drove this uh, church consultant back to the airport. Of course, he finished his stay of seven, ten days, something like that. And he, he just flat, flat out asked him, he said, you know, you've, you've done this a lot, right? You've had a lot of experiences. How does this particular instance measure up? And, and they, um, the consultant said, he said, I had one, one uh, experience that I'll never forget. He said the, they had worked through reconciliation over, over weeks, over months. They finally got to a place where they were ready to settle down and and build this thing back up from the, the chaos it had become. But, but the pastor was unwilling to utter an apology. He, he simply wouldn't show any signs of weakness, no signs of a confession whatsoever. He said he had to write out an apology for him, three to four sentences on a piece of paper. That was the only way that this pastor, who was, who was in the wrong, could apologize to their church and to his, his staff. He said this one was worse than that. He said he, he didn't even engage in the process before I even came out here. So all the money that you guys spent on this church consultant basically made, made no difference whatsoever. He gave up early on. It single-handedly developed my leadership uh, more than anything. God really used it. I saw what happens when con uh, conflicts are unresolved, hearts become hardened, when image becomes more important than humility. And, and I identified a lot of my own weaknesses in that, uh, going through that, you see a lot of your own sin and uh, areas where you contributed to the problem rather than the solution. But most of all, through that, that experience, I was there for one year, and a um, uh, pastor of mine, we discussed this whole, whole time, and he said, you probably got about six years experience on you in ministry in that one year of dealing with turmoil and conflict. And I really saw to understand, I, I got a glimpse of the difference between true repentance and false repentance. Because there was a lot of apologies and there was a lot of confessions going on, but at the end of the day, there was still a, a huge gap. There was a huge, huge chasm between true repentance on the one hand 
and false repentance on the other hand. Now, thanks to a guy named Sigmund Freud, all of us lean toward false repentance. And Freud did what nobody else has done in the history of the church and the history of our world, and that is he replaced Christian religion with self. He committed the ultimate act of idolatry. And he said that God should be replaced ultimately with our felt needs. So for Freud, all of life is to be interpreted by how I feel and what I perceive the situation to be about. He created a therapy that really replaced Christianity with psychology. And all of life became a pursuit of happiness, not by searching for God, but by satisfying the self. Rod Dreher says psychology did not necessarily intend to change man's character as in repentance, but rather to help man become more comfortable with who he is. In the Bible, mankind is born to be redeemed. Today, mankind is born to be pleased. In the Bible, God establishes his kingdom. Today, mankind establishes their kingdom. And everything stems from a very low view of sin. Sin is mutiny against the true king. It corrupts, it cripples, and it contaminates everything that it touches. Cornelius Plantinga says all human beings have a biblically certifiable and empirically demonstrable bias toward evil. We are both complicitous in and molested by the evil force of our race. We both discover evil and invent it. We both ratify evil and extend it. Sin in the Bible is about is as bad as it gets. But we often view sin from our point of view rather than seeing sin from God's point of view. And rebels don't get repentance because sinners don't ultimately get sin. Sin is original from Adam. It is actual from ourselves, and it is indwelling from our nature. And I like what one writer says about marriage. He puts this all in perspective for me. He says, in marriage, couples don't fall out of love. Couples fall out of repentance. And that's exactly what happens when sin comes into our life and devastates us. It's not because we fall out of love for God. It's because we fall out of repentance from sin. Luther's first thesis nails it right on the head in his 95 theses, the very first one that he nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel almost 500 years ago. It says this, Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ in saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, intended that the whole life of believers should be penitence means repentance. Repentance is not a one-time act as much as it is a lifelong action. It's not one and done. Repent, you don't treat sin like you treat a cold. Repentance is not like going to the doctor once and being cured. Michael Horton says repentance is not once and for all transition, but a perpetual cycle that defines the Christian life. And so this morning, I want to look at repentance, and we're going to see three things as we go through two really key texts in the Bible. We're going to see true repentance in the life of David, Psalm 32. Then we're going to see false repentance in the life of Saul, and that's 1 Samuel 15. And then we're going to ultimately ask this question, well, what difference does it make? What's what's the ultimate difference between true repentance and false repentance? And I think Lewis begins to nail it on the head, our friend Clive Staples. He says, what was the sort of hole that man got himself into? He had tried to set up on his own and to behave as, a, as though he belonged to himself. In other words, fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. Laying down your arms, surrendering, saying that you are sorry, realizing that you have been on the wrong track, and getting ready to start life over again from the ground up. That is the only way out of our hole. And this process of surrender is what Christians call repentance. Number one in your outline, number one this morning. Psalm 32 is true repentance. Now, David, the king of Israel, as as great as he was, the king after God's own heart, committed two detestable acts. That is, he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he committed murder with his wife, her wife, her her husband, Uriah. Uriah uh, comes from the Hebrew word that means uh, light, he who gives light. Very interesting. Um, Prophet Nathan comes to King David with truth. And David had a, before we go any further in this, David had a person in his life who could speak the truth to him in love. Most of us fail in the area of repentance right off the bat because we don't have anybody in our life who can speak the truth to us in love. After all, we're the Sigmund Freud generation. 
We want to surround ourselves with people who tell us what we want to hear, not what we need to hear about our sin. Josh Hamilton is a, a prime example. Josh Hamilton is one of the most gifted athletes ever to put on the cleats and work, walk on a baseball field. Coming out of the minor leagues, out of high school, he was ready to sign up for pro ball. Unbelievable athlete. After a series of wrong decisions, tattoo parlors, addictions, landed himself in the Betty Ford Clinic. He went to mom and dad because of drug addictions in his life. Mom and dad tried to show him love and, and gave him truth, kicked him out of the house. He went to this Betty Ford Clinic. Betty Ford Clinic showed him love, accepted him, and then gave him truth and he worked his way out of the Betty Ford Clinic. Finally, the only person left to love Josh Hamilton was Grandma. And Grandma took him in and showed him love. But she also gave him truth. And he said, if you're going to stay in this house, you're going to live this way. And finally, it was that grace and truth aspect that woke Josh Hamilton up and allowed him to enter a, a career in baseball dealing with a, a recovering addict. Grandma would not be manipulated Grandma called Josh out. Nathan the prophet will not be manipulated in David's life. Nathan is going to call David out for his sin. He tells him what nobody else had the courage to tell the king. After all, he was the most powerful, friend, powerful person in the country, in the land at that time. How are you going to call the king out on his sin? In 2 Samuel 2.13, what you see is, and I don't want to get into the passage, Nathan approaches David a very sincere way, gives him a, an illustration, really a word picture about sheep. And at the end of it, David realizes what he had done. And he utters one thing back to the prophet Nathan. When, when Nathan approached him, he said, one thing, I have sinned. And then David did something remarkable. He listened to what the prophet was going to say. The only thing he said, the whole entire passage in 2 Samuel 13, I have sinned. And he humbled himself and he listened. And verse 13 is loaded. Psalm 32 fleshes that out. Psalm 32, look at verse 2. David writes, Blessed is the man after the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, you get a reflection of, David dealing with a sin in his life and in his heart. When I kept silence, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. I like what Spurgeon says. God's hand is very helpful when it uplifts. It is awful when it presses down. Better a world on the shoulder like Atlas than God's hand on the heart like David. Notice what David says. He says, blessed is the man in whom spirit there is no deceit, right? So all of us deserve blessing because none of us have any deceit in our life, right? Who's the person in whose spirit there is no deceit? Listen to NET. It says, the point is not that this person is sinless or pure. The psalmist is speaking of someone who refuses to deny or to hide his sin. Blessed is the man who refuses to hide from his sin. Blessed is the man who refuses to deny that he has done a sinful thing in the act of God. And it leads me to my first principle on true repentance. True repentance is found in humiliation, not manipulation. True repentance is found in humiliation, not manipulation. And our, our default mode when we know that there's sin in our life is to manipulate for our benefit rather than to be humiliated for God's benefit. David treasures his humiliation rather than works for his manipulation. Principle number two, true repentance is wholehearted confession, not half-hearted admission. True repentance is wholehearted confession, not half-hearted admission. Look at verse one. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now skip down to verse five. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. Now, here's what happens in our house, and this will hopefully flesh it out for everybody. Uh, naturally, something will go on with our kids. They'll do something they're not supposed to do. I'll say, Ethan, like, clobbers Henry over the head with something, right? And we say, Ethan, you know, go apologize to your brother. Why did, why did you do that? And so Ethan walks over. Sorry, Henry. Walks back. And we say, all right, let's try this again. Just go to your brother. 
what do you say to your brother? I'm sorry, Henry. Sorry for what? I don't know, Dad. What am I sorry for? Here's, here's why we are apologizing. We apologizing for things that are specific. A general apology is a general not confession. Uh, I don't know any other way to say that. When you apologize for something, you are very specific on what you are apologizing for. And David is very specific on what he is apologizing and repenting for. Sin, verse 1. Transgression is forgiven. Sin is covered, verse 2. Blessed is the man whom the Lord counts. No iniquity, verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. These are very key. They are very strong words. And a a fascinating thing happens in Psalm 32. See, when David uncovers his sin in confession, God covers the sin in forgiveness. So on one hand, the sinner is uncovering. On the other hand, the one who forgives is covering. It's a great play on words. Psalm 32 is heartfelt confession of uncovering. Principle number three about true repentance. True repentance is a long-term recognition, not a short-term reaction. True repentance is a long-term recognition, not a short-term reaction. Skip down to verse 9. We usually don't read this one in Psalm 32, but it's good. Verse 9, be not like the horse or the mule without understanding. Now, what do a horse and a mule have in common? It's not long tails and long necks and long noses. Horses and mules are stubborn. If you don't believe me, Marvin Guerin is sitting right there in a blue shirt. And he has ridden more buck and broncos and been thrown off more horses in his life than you guys will ever know because they are stubborn creatures. You cannot deal with a stubborn creature. It is almost impossible. So Psalm 32, be not like the stubborn horse or the stubborn mule with no understanding. I want to read the last half of verse 9 in the New Living Translation. It says that the mule and the horse need bit and bridle to keep it under control. See, true repentance is a long-term recognition. And the recognition is that we want control of our life. Whenever we sin, recognize that you do it because you desire control over your life. A truly repentant person knows that if the life has chaos unless God is in control. A truly repentant person knows that life has chaos unless God is in control, but we all fight for control. We all deal with sin and the sin of control. Psalm 32 2 Samuel chapter 13, chapter uh, 12, excuse me, true repentance. 1 Samuel 15, false repentance. Turn back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel compare two kings, Saul and David. 1 Samuel is about a king after God's own heart, a king with a hardened heart, excuse me, Saul. 2 Samuel is a king after God's own heart, that is David. David was caught in sin in 2 Samuel, chapter 12. Saul is caught in sin in 1 Samuel, chapter 15. A prophet came to David to confront him of his sin, named Nathan. A prophet came to Saul to confront him of his sin, named Samuel. And we pick this up in 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 12. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, this is very interesting, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on, and and he went down to Gilgal. Now, Saul is not interested in humiliation right now, he's interested in manipulation. When the prophet Samuel comes to Saul, he's building statues to himself, monuments to himself. David's response when the prophet comes is confession. Saul's response when the prophet comes is construction. David gives away his kingdom. Saul is trying to build his kingdom. David's response, I have sinned against the Lord. Saul's response, verse 13, Samuel came to Saul. Saul said to him, blessed be you the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. No, he didn't. And watch the manipulation unfold. Verse 20. Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on the mission which the Lord God sent me. 
I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. Verse 21, but the people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, and the best of the things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Now Saul had a command. He was to go to the Amalekites. He was to destroy everybody and everything. He didn't do that. He kept the best of the herds and the flocks for himself, and he didn't kill the king, the one who was responsible for the Amalekites and what they did to the Israelites when they came out of Egypt in the wilderness. And he says to, to Samuel, he says, I've obeyed the Lord. I've, I've done exactly what you have asked, but the people are the ones to be blamed. They're the ones. And so now he's going to manipulate the prophet in order to substantiate his sin. He manipulates for his own purpose so that he can sound a little bit better on the backside of this. Look at verse 22. Samuel said, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You're, you're telling me you're going to sacrifice, but you're not being obedient to what the Lord has called you to do. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen. I love that. To listen is better than the fat of rams. You know what ignited Sigmund Freud on his quest for the quasi-religion of self? Freud said this, religion is nothing more than a man-made mechanism to deal with life. People who are religious are going to God when they need God to deal with problems that they have in their life. Mankind turned ultimately religion to get what we want out of it. This is the history of religion. Remember uh, Tiger Woods? You know, he's like the perpetual sermon illustration when it comes to David and Bathsheba and all this other stuff. Um, when Tiger Woods met a nine iron through his uh, driver's side, passenger side window, uh, he finally kind of tried to put his life back together. And he came into the media with a prepared question and a prepared reply to it. And this was like the ultimate epic fail because I, I used to love Tiger. Man, I'd, I had a photo of his swing uh, stage by stage in my dorm room at college, and I would just, man, if I could get right there, just like Tiger, and it was like, it was this huge poster, and I used to emulate him to get my swing so I could be like Tiger. When he came out and he realized what he had done, his, his substantiation, his reason for how things got so bad in his life, he said, I abandoned my Buddhism, and he said, I didn't need God basically when things were good, but now I need God because things are bad. And he used his religion to manipulate God. Do you know anyone who goes to God when it's convenient to go to God? America loves the convenient God. We really don't like the controlling God. We treat God like a spare tire. He's, he's really nice when we need him in emergencies, but most of the time, we don't even know he's there. Hopefully the spare's got air in it. Saul, really convenient to disobey God. Too bad it wasn't commanded by God. Verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, and, th and this is almost verbatim what David said to Nathan. Saul said to Samuel, verse 24, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words. But he doesn't stop there, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin, return with me that I might bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Now, why didn't Samuel do for Saul what Nathan did for David? They said the same thing. I have sinned. I'm guilty. I've transgressed against God. Saul said he sinned. Verse 24, I have sinned, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. He goes, false repentance is admission, not true confession. Saul was admitting his sin, but he wasn't confessing his sin. He alluded to his sin, but he didn't own his sin. And how do I know that when I read the text? Because he brings up the people. I'm not the only one responsible here. It's the people are still involved. Further, instead of listening to Samuel, just shutting his mouth and completely listening to the prophet. He continues on and he explains himself. It was because of the people. In fact, if you could do this one thing for me, 
Verse 25, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me. So I'm asking you to do something that I might bow before the Lord. Why, why do you think that you're in a position to ask me to do anything right now? You're in a position to repent and confess your sin and listen and submit yourself to the counsel of the Lord. That is, I shouldn't be hearing anything from you. And yet you keep on talking. It's a confession with strings attached. With his no, it's no confession at all. There is no confession. Finally, Saul's admission is a short-term reaction, not a long-term recognition. It, he reacts right there in the short term, but in the long term, he's not changed. He's not any better, any different of a person. Verse 27, Samuel turned to go away, and Saul seized the skirt of his robe and tore it. And that will not be the only skirt that is torn in the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel turned to go away. Saul seized the skirt of his robe and he tore it. Samuel said to them, the Lord has torn the kingdom from, of Israel from you this day and has given you to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Tim Keller says the most painful times in our lives are when our idols are being threatened. Samuel threatened to take away Saul's biggest idol, control. Saul did everything he could to hang on to his kingdom. He reached out and he was literally grabbing for his kingdom and for his way and for his power. God was doing everything he could to tear Saul from his kingdom. Amazing thing happens, you know, in this text because, you know, there's still hope here, right? We were talking in our Sunday school about our culture, where we are as a culture, and it's kind of just a bleak and solemn Sunday school this morning. Um, but there's still hope, and there's still hope for Saul. Because I like what one writer says. He says, sometimes God appears to be killing us when actually he's saving us. Sometimes God appears to be killing us when we're dealing with our own sin, but actually he's saving us by bringing us to an end of ourselves. God is trying to empty Saul in order to save Saul. That's repentance. If we can get there and allow God to do that process, that's true repentance. What difference does it make? There's uh, two Hebrew words for repentance in the Old Testament. One of them is the more common. It's pronounced shuv. It occurs over a, th a thousand times in the Old Testament because it is a key concept in the Old Testament. And shuv fundamentally means to turn in an opposite direction. You were going in one way, and now you turn away from that, and you go in a completely different direction. Bruce Damaris says, its primary theological meaning is to turn penitently from sin to God, including a repudiation of all of sin and an affirmation of God's total will for your life. Ezekiel 18.30 uses this word shuv. It says, repent and turn from your wickedness. Two verses later, verse 32, I take no delight in the death of anyone. Repent and live. The implication is if you don't turn your life from that path, you won't live. It'll destroy you. The other Hebrew word is, is pronounced nacham. And nacham is a, it's a word like our English word buzz. It sounds like what it means. Uh, biblical scholars call this an onomatopoeia. And if you want me to, to spell that, you'll have to find some eighth grader on ESPN to spell that for you. It's a word that sounds like what it means. And an onomatopoeia, when you say nacham, I repent, nacham, nacham. Nahum, I can't believe what I've done. I'm so despicable in the sight of God. This is what Job does at the end of the book. He repents in dust and ashes. Nahum, God, why have I been so foolish? And Nahum, is a, it's a more highly nuanced meaning. It can mean anything from feeling regret, looking to God for comfort, or relenting, which is essentially changing your mind. Uh, Nakam is a word that is used of God, God changing his mind in the Old Testament, almost even more than man, which is interesting. But in the Old Testament altogether, repentance has a, a negative aspect and a positive aspect. So negatively, it means turning away from ourself and our sin, and positively, it means turning to God. The Greek has basically one word for repentance. It's metanoia. Metanoeo is, is the verb form. It comes from two words. Meta is after and now says the word for uh, mind. So it's an aftermind, it's an afterthought. 
Literally, metanoia means to change your mind, come to an, a different thought about yourself, about your sin, about your life, about the direction that you're heading. Jesus begins and he describes the totality of his ministry with this word, metanoia, repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The most famous passage in the New Testament is uh, Luke 13 on repentance. And this big tower falls on a, a huge group of people, the Tower of Siloam, I think it is. It falls on a huge group of people. They all die instantaneously. And Jesus basically uses the same word repentance. He says, unless you repent, you might as well have had a tower that fell on you because the same fate, destruction awaits unless you repent. Change your mind. The New Testament distinguishes between repentance itself and the fruits of repentance. And so true repentance is always, always indicated by fruit in the life. There's always going to be something that substantiates true repentance. Now listen, we don't know the heart. When people come and confess their sins to you and repent of certain sins, we don't actually know their heart if they're truly confessing or if they're just admitting their sin. But their life should display you. We have a better indication of they are truly repentant. They will have deeds that show the repentance that took place in their heart. Michael Horton says, repentance pertains not simply to certain sins. Pagans can be remorseful for their immoderate behavior. Rather, repentance is the revulsion of the whole self toward alliance with sin and death. And whenever repentance is marginalized in conversion, it is usually because of an inadequate sense of God's holiness and the just demands of his righteous law. We are reputing our entire self. Our alliance with sin and death is in the past. And we are allying now with God in life everlasting. This is what repentance is. One theologian says the whole self must be turned away both from self-trust and from autonomy that demands final say in our life as to what we will believe, whom we will trust, and how we will live. All of us as unbelievers have lived on the throne of our hearts for far too long. We fought hard for our autonomy for control of our life, to do what we want to do. We all fight hard for our own individual kingdoms. Repentance is a change in the heart away from that. You cannot repent on your own terms. To repent on your own terms is no repentance at all. To repent is come to the end of your own terms and come to God's terms. And C.S. Lewis is, again, he's got the, the, the clearest example of repentance. It's hard to define in the Bible, but this is ultimately what it comes down to. He says, repentance is no fun at all. It's something much harder than merely eating humble pie. It means unlearning all the self-conceit and the self-will that we have been training ourselves into for thousands of years. It means killing a part of yourself and undergoing a kind of death. It is a willing submission to humiliation. If you ask God to take you back without repentance, you are asking him to let you go back without going back. It is impossible. It cannot happen, says Lewis. I want to give you uh, three characteristics of the truly repentant in Scripture. The truly repentant person uncovers sin in order to find cover in a Savior. A truly repentant person uncovers sin in order to find cover in a Savior. David uncovered his sin, and a Savior covered it. We obsess about fig leaves before men while ignoring our nakedness before God. And the paradox of repentance is the more we try to hide our sin, the more it exposes our nakedness. The more we try to hide our sin in the life, the more naked and bare we are before an all-knowing God. And I love what Bonhoeffer says because people play a huge part in the life of repentance. He says, nothing can be more cruel than the tenderness that consigns another to his sin, but nothing can be more compassionate than the severe rebuke that calls the brother back from the path of sin. Number two, truly repentant friendships are substantial, not superficial. Truly repentant friendships are substantial. They're not superficial. Listen to Ephesians 4.15. We speak the truth in love in order to grow up into Christ in every way who is our head, 
Ecclesiastes 7, verse 5, gives us a little wisdom from the Old Testament. It says, it is better to hear the rebuke of a wise than to listen to the song of a fool. Who do you have in your life that you have given permission to say the difficult thing to? To open up in a way that you don't open up to anybody else? Do you have a Nathan in your life? who you have given permission to confront you when you don't want to be confronted? Or do you just have Samuels in your life who, when they don't tell you what you want to hear, you cast them out and do your own thing? All of us needs a Nathan because all of us need somebody who can speak the truth in love. Most of us actually have this person in our life. The problem is we tend to chase them away. (laughs) Most of us, at some point in time, have had somebody tell us the truth in love, the difficult thing, but we don't want to hear truth, we just want to hear love, which isn't really love at all. I like what one guy says, he says, truth without love is brutality, love without truth is hypocrisy. That's not love at all. Truly repentant are are Christ-centered, not self-centered. The truly repentant person is Christ-centered, not self-centered. Just want to read one verse Two verses out of Luke 9, verse 23 and 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Daily. That little word. Wish it wasn't in there. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life must lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. We're in a four-week series on hospitality. I've set up a a little living room setting. This actually comes from our fireside room, thanks to the likes of Marilyn Slaymaker and Darla Stuckey and just wonderful furniture in there. So uh, this is our little living room setting, and we're teaching on hospitality. And last week we looked at our identity in Christ. This week we're looking at our repentance. And everybody's going to ask, you know, what does all this stuff have to do with hospitality, right? I mean, where are we? I mean, open your home. I, I think that's where we need to go with this hospitality unit. And first, what we said last week, you never know what you need until you know who you are. You never know the hospitality that you need until you fully understand the sinner and the person who's righteous and still sins. That is who you are. And so all of us need hospitality because of our identity, who we are. Second, you'll never truly open up your life until you see that repentance is all of life. You will always guard your own reputation, and pridefully you will put the fences, you will build the ivory tower very tall. When you see that repentance is all of life, you see that the ivory towers must fall. You begin to open up your life in a new way that you never knew before. Remember what David said, when I, when I held my sin in, my bones wasted away. But when I confessed my sin, He found a a magnificent relief and comfort in God. So just a spoiler alert here. Hospitality doesn't just have to do with opening your home. Uh, It's a gift. Hospitality has to do with opening your heart in your life. And if you don't have a Nathan who you have allowed your heart to be open to, It's not necessarily a failure in your identity or necessarily even in your repentance. It's a failure to understand hospitality. Open hearts welcome other open hearts. Luther, um, hospitality is a gift. But when it's related to accountability, it's not an option. So so some of you are going to open your homes, and we've got this this great small group ministry called Life Together, and some of you are. And, and you, be, you have a gift of hospitality. But accountability in your life is not a gift. It's not an option. It is, it is absolutely needed. And so in many ways, opening your heart and opening your life is we're past the gifting here. Now we're to the New Testament mandates of living in community with one another. And Luther gets to this when he discusses repentance. I just I want you to listen to Luther's thoughts because Luther was great on giving the people a Bible in their own language and on the doctrine of salvation and the righteousness of God. He is, he is excellent at it. And when he came down, came down to it, what he really did is he got to the heart of repentance. And here's what he says. Luther said, The sinner finds himself driven to despair, his confidence in himself totally shaken, 
finding himself under the wrath of God, he counts himself as damned, and he experiences, Luther says, a delicious despair. He goes on, he says, the sinner in repentance learns to trust only in God. And insofar as repentance takes everything away from us, it leaves nothing left but God. And it cannot take God away from us. It actually brings us closer to God. Nothing will stand in the way of true repentance like false religion. And the subtle danger of religion is that it becomes more important to look spiritual than actually be spiritual. Do you have a person in your life that you have confessed your deepest sins to? Do you have a Nathan? Are you more concerned about your image, like Saul? When's the last time you poured your heart out to somebody who would just listen? I've sinned. Just listen. I just need to listen for a while. Repentant people need other repentant people. And actually being an instrument in the hands of the Redeemer is redeemed people in need of change ministering to other redeemed people in need of change. Repentant people need other repentant people. And so if you don't have this in your life today, our, our Life Together ministry is a great opportunity to engage at this level of intimacy with friends and this level of openness and honesty with each other. If you don't have this, you'll end up finding it in a complete different stranger. You will end up showing up at a, uh, a counseling center, a professional counselor, and you will weep and you will cry your eyes out before somebody that you don't even know for sins that you have committed, that you are finally acknowledging for the first time in your life. And if you don't believe me, Steve and Debbie Coles are here today. They see it weekly in England. Guys show up with divorced papers that work with Steve, and they say, Steve, I don't know where to go. You know the first thing that Steve and Debbie are going to do? They're going to open their home. They're going to sit down in their home and give them a safe place to open up their hearts and confess their sins. If you don't have that, you will be forced to have it. Find those relationships now with people who love you rather than confessing and bawling out before a stranger. Be hospitable. Let's pray. Father, uh, you know, this series on hospitality is, is ultimately it's designed to highlight our, our life together ministry. I'm, I'm convinced our leadership at Whitewater Community Church is convinced that we need to think about ministry different than we have ever thought about it in the past. People have sin in their lives and they're not coming to the church because they feel judged, they feel insecure. They feel like they're coming into an ivory tower. They're unwanted. And so we've, we've created this ministry, Lord, that we feel you have guided us to, to approach ministry in a different framework, a ministry of openness and honesty before people. And, and Lord, my, my prayer is that people won't see this as some kind of lovey-dovey, share your emotions, feelings, let's cry together and have a cup of coffee type of ministry. My prayer is that people will see this as an identity ministry, a repentance ministry, a confession ministry, a ministry of accountability. My prayer is that people see this ministry as doing life together with people who speak the truth in love, not just love only, not just truth only, but speak the truth in love. God, I, I pray. If there's anybody out there today who's, who's dealing with this stuff and these sins, um, you would direct them as you will, as your spirit will. Uh, to people who have opened their hearts and their lives to many in this community. Father, I want to lift up uh, Debbie Tyson and, and Abby and their family. You know, uh, Dad recently passed away, and so I pray for them. I want to pray for Jackie Wietrich this morning as um, she recovers from surgery, and just pray for continued health there, that the doctors were able to uh, identify everything and, and treat uh, the cancer and eliminate it entirely. We pray for a good prognosis. We pray for comfort, for healing. 
Lord, uh, do a work in Jackie's life that only you can do and um, help this to be just such a, a great opportunity to glorify in who you are. Uh, pray for Doug and Crystal this morning. Thank you for bringing them to us this, this morning. Pray for uh, their marriage, for their kids, for their family. Just a great testimony for Steve and Debbie. I'm going to hear for them next week for, for Ponca Bible Camp. I see uh, um, Mike and Victoria out here today. And just thank you for Mike's ministry at Ponca. And uh, pray that you'd bless him. Give him the energy that you have only given to Mike Schultz that we all know and love so well um, to minister to these kids. And, and that Ponca would be a, a great avenue for uh, redemptive ministry to happen. Father, we pray all this to you through the Son and by the Spirit, for you three are the one true God, and there is no God besides you. Amen. If you guys are all 